coming to stretch and like I've seen before, but the fa- faces are cool. Yeah, you're face stretches. Yeah. All right. So today, I'm joined by Tattoo John. Well, I'm not Tattoo John anymore. I gave, I gave up Tattoo John when I nearly got killed in FX gym. As right. you know. So. so with my guests, I like to go back to the beginning. Like every good interviewer, find out who you are, where you come from. Yeah. Go. My name is John, and I was born in May Day Hospital, which is now called Croydon University Hospital because they changed the name after everyone was calling it May Die yeah. because literally every single person that goes there ends up coming out of the box. So, yeah. I was born in May Day Hospital. I grew up to two Irish parents, two Irish immigrants on the New Addington estate. My parents moved onto the New Addington estate when it was first built. So they were literally the first people on there. And I don't know when that was. I don't know. I think it's the 1960s. Now, the thing about what we call Addo yeah. is uh, it's, <coughs> it's, a, it's not like a normal council estate that you'd find in London. It's it's like... It's purpose-built on a green belt. So it's... And it's out of the way. It's, it's got... And this is another thing that I learned from the police told me this when I owned Steel Gym up there there's one there's, it was built with one road in and one road out so you can if you have a police car on the bottom by um, the harvester and you have a police car at the top at the top of King Henry's Drive that's it that's, yes. that's it you, everything else is just built around the outside so you, there's only one way in and one way out so if you do something and you go on to the estate the police know that you're in there somewhere it's, it's, it's actually crazy yeah. it's um it's just a funny estate it's classed as london-ish but it's kind of kent still it's, well, it's, it's surrey a it's got a surrey it's actually classed as surrey new addington coin and surrey and if you think about the area that's nearby biggin hill which is a beautiful area yeah and it's very very affluent and it's full, of, say that. Yeah. It's full of a lot of people with a lot of money to have something like Addington right next to it is crazy. It's cra- I would have liked to have seen it back in the day when my parents first moved onto it. I would have liked to see what it looked like brand spanking new. But I had, a, I had an amazing childhood. Like I grew up in a three be- three bedroom. No, it was a two. Yeah, it was a three bedroom house because there was four kids. So at one point there was three boys in one room, and my sister had the box room because obviously she had to have her own room. And there was me and my little brother, Paul, in the bunk beds. And then there was Michael, who I don't, I'm not sure exactly how much older he is than me, but I remember him being a teenager um, while me and Paul were like seven and eight. So you think he's got all these hormones, he's getting into his music, he's like, he's into his clothes, and he's got these two little shits that live in, live in his bedroom in a bunk bed that won't leave his possessions alone. So every time he leaves the room... We're breaking his shit. We're scratching his record. We're going through his stuff. And he's coming home from wherever he's doing, hanging about, drinking, meeting girls and stuff. He's coming home. Then he's going mental. Like, we've fucked his stuff up. We've gone on his record player. We've been playing around, scratching his fucking records, taking his aftershave. I'll never forget once I found one of his lock knives. And I'm stood in front of the mirror. And I'm like, I'm about eight. And I've got this lock knife. And I'm like, in front of the mirror, and I'm fucking... Uh, look at me, I'm hard. And when all I, next thing I remember, my mum shouting, John, dinner's ready. I put it, I've got so freaked out, I've gone to put the lock knife down so quickly, I've sliced the top of my finger. Now, bearing in mind, I'm, I'm pouring my blood and now I've got to go downstairs and face my mum. Dinner's on the table, I'm thinking, what am I going to do? So I'm wrapping tissue around it, I'm trying to hold it, stop the bleeding. And she never noticed. I went down, had my, had my dinner whilst having a big massive gash in the top of my finger. So I do actually feel sorry for my older brother because he tolerated some bullshit from us when we were kids, man. We put him through hell. So now you've got an interesting family as such because your sister's actually a She's a priest. Priest, yeah. She's actually the right Reverend Carol Morrison of Kenley. So she is the priest in Kenley, which, oh, is, wow. which is a really, really beautiful area. So she's got her own church. So yeah, yeah our family... We got the three brothers, and then we got the sister, my sister. My mum and dad were married for 57 years before my dad passed away, and they both come from big, big families. So I sat down once and tried to, well, I did count up 
all my immediate family, as in uncles, aunts, and first cousins. There were sixty-seven of us. So there's a lot. There's a lot of us out there spread around the world. Wow. Yeah. Wow. And a lot. A lot of my cousins are naughty. I've got some naughty cousins. Maybe not so much now, but I have. Well, it's no, it's no secret. Your brother's quite naughty. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he was. He was. And there's no secret that you are well known in Croydon, to say the least. Not so much anymore, but at, w- at one point, yeah, I yeah. would have been well known. So take us this fast forward now. Um, what was school life there? School was actually amazing because I did so well at school. I ended up getting a scholarship into Trinity. So I I went to Applegarth in New Addington and was almost like one or two years ahead when it came to English and art and stuff like that. So I got pinpointed to take a scholarship, which is an exam for the boys' school, Trinity. And um, I passed it. So I got accepted into Trinity Boys' School, which is up in Shirley. So I went there for a year. Yeah, what happened? Um, we had to move um, out of Addington because we had some problems with our, some of our neighbours and my parents just wanted to get us out and away from the area. We, we used to encounter a lot of, it was a lot of race hate back in the 80s, especially due to the fact that um, the Irish were targeted the same way that the Muslims are targeted today. Yeah, because of the whole IRA thing and yeah. stuff like that. Even if you had nothing to do with it, you were still called IRA. IRA. I can remember being called a terrorist at the age of nine. You get back to your own fucking country. See, that's interesting, isn't it? It's like the circle keeps going around. This is why I'm so pro Muslim and pro. I'm so pro immigration, not only because my mum and my dad are immigrants, but immig- immigration holds the UK together. It holds it together. It's the glue that holds the UK together. English people are not out there delivering for Deliveroo. English people aren't out there cleaning cars. They're not out there um, working in restaurants, waiting tables. You know what I mean? All the really, really shit jobs, in my in my opinion, are done by the immigrants. Well, that's not my opinion. Even, <laughs> even things like cleaning hotel rooms. I remember watching a documentary about they got some English people that were out of work and they were like, right, we're going to test you and pick you up against these these immigrants that clean hotel rooms for this Palestinian hotel owner that got built up this fifty million pound like um, hotel fortune in London, and the English people were not able to do the job in the same time that the that the immigrants were. So you got like these Polish girls that are cleaning a room top to bottom in forty five minutes. English girls couldn't keep up. It's interesting. There's so many stats one way or the other. I don't have an, I don't really know about it. I find the whole parallel between being an Irish immigrant in the eighties and being a Muslim immigrant in the last well since nine eleven. Yeah, exactly. And that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Just the, the the correlations between the two, like getting told to go back to your own country. You're a me, terrorist. Me yeah, getting told yeah. going back to your own country, and it's interesting because I've had I've had people. I've actually like I say earlier on. I've actually been shouted at on a bus by a, by a school kid and called NF. And I turned around, I was like, what did you say? And I went over to him and said, what are you talking about? He's calling me National Front. I'm like, mate, I'm, I'm, an, I'm the son of a pair of immigrants that come over here like in the 1960s or the 1970s, no, 1960s it would have been. So it's like, it's almost mad to, to think that there's people out there that would look at me and think, oh look, he's an English racist. That, that, is, that is crazy. And NF hasn't been around for so no. long. I don't even, probably not even in recent history. Well, in our history, that NF's been around. No. It's weird, isn't it? But I'm very pro... I think I take everyone on, on face value. But that's coming from Croydon, though. Yeah. That is how, like Coming from Croydon, Croydon was multicultural before that was even a thing. Yeah. So we've all grown up around different races and stuff. And it's just part of our, our existence growing up. Like going to the gym... Like we we're going to talk about FX Gym that that used yeah. to be in the heart of Croydon, and it was like a hub for all kinds of criminals and nonsense and all kinds of stuff going on there. But if you come in, you was just accepted. Yeah. There, there was no sort of like it doesn't matter if you was Muslim, if you was like a villain, or if you was just a silly boy from Middlesdown like me. Mm. Do you know what I mean? It, it wasn't a thing. Well, FX was it was different. It was like it was like a family. I mean, was, when, yeah. when you look at my wedding pictures, like half of the gym members are at my wedding. Yeah. 
So it was like... It I was, didn't get an invite, by the way. No. It was very exclusive for my wedding. I think I was only allowed to have 60 guests. And it was, um, what was it, a sit-down meal? We, we hired at a castle, which was quite interesting. Yeah. But anyway, we're not here to discuss that. Yeah. Let's fast forward to your life as a young adult. Now, you started off life as a kickboxer. I got into kickboxing when I was 20, 19, because a friend of mine called Vince Boyce, he took me to a, a Thai boxing club, which was in Aden, funny enough. And it just, um, <clears throat> I had a few lessons. And the way Vince used to describe his first fight just used to get me fired up. Like the, the adrenaline, he because he had a fight, he had a kickboxing fight, and the way he used to speak to me about it. And what gave me the confidence to try it was actually spending the summer in Ibiza. So when I was 19, I went to work out in Ibiza and I, I stayed out there for five and a half months and it was an amazing time. And I came back and I thought, you know what, if I can do that, then maybe I can compete in a, in a, in a combat sport. And so I actually had my first kickboxing fight. I'd had, I think, five weeks of training and no sparring at all. Five weeks of training and then... One evening in between, in the middle of that training, I, I had a party at my house, got smashed. So I had five weeks of kickboxing training and then entered a kickboxing competition at the Ilford Town Hall in Essex. And everyone was like, what are you doing? Like, you're crazy. Like, you can't fight. But from what I know of you, fighting comes naturally. I think that's in, I think that's part of my Irish heritage. I think we, I just feel like there's something in my DNA that makes, it took me a long time to actually figure out that I had what it took to be able to have a fight. So walk me through that first fight. The first fight, the competitive one. Yeah. We got the train down there. i never forget it. And then the reason why I never forget it is a lad called Jimmy was competing as well. And he, I hadn't seen him at the gym. So he hadn't been training and he's on the train. And he's reading, this is no word of a lie, he's reading a Bruce Lee Techniques book on the train. And I'm like, mate, you're going to need more than a fucking Bruce Lee book. You're about to get in a ring with someone. So there was a geezer called Matt, he was competing. He was a heavy weed smoker. Then there was Jimmy, um, he was competing. He was the one that was reading the Bruce Lee book. <laughs> they both got, they got, they both got beat, beaten up. Jimmy got his nose plastered across the side of his face. I managed to get lucky and knock the geezer out 50 seconds into the first round. But all literally just windmilling. <laughs> just literally, when I knocked him out, I had my head in his chest and I was just windmilling and I caught him with a left uh, a left and a right hook. And on the video, you see his head go, boom, boom, like that. So like the left hook spins in that way, the right hook spins in that way, boom, boom. And he was out cold. And he was had to sit with the paramedics afterwards because he had um, concussion. And I never forget my trainer getting up and, and telling me, like, calm down, because I'm celebrating. I'm like, yeah, fucking hell, I killed him. I'm like, I killed him. <laughs> and he's laying on the fucking floor. My trainer's like, John, John, no, 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 no. Wait, just please wait until you find out he's all right. And he was, he was in a bad way for about two hours. He couldn't, he couldn't remember who he was. Couldn't remember why he was there. And I had, like, a close little circle of family and friends that came to watch me. But a lot of people were like, you can't fight. Like, what are you doing? Right. Like, so after that, I'm like, yeah, all right. Look, I can, gonna, have a, I can have a tear up. <laughs> this is going to be a bit of a reoccurring thing during your story. People telling you you can't do stuff. Oh, definitely, all the time. But it's, I think it, I think it happens to everyone. I don't know. You're, yeah, but you're quite extreme. So after that fight, you get into it now. Now you've got a, uh, a bug for it. So I get that buzz, that winner's buzz. I get the trophy. That say that basically says that I've just won a fight. So I'm like, fucking hell, I'm one and oh, I'm a kickboxer, and I can go and tell people that now. So then I throw myself into it and I'm training, um, I'm training like six days a week, but I'm still not sparring. So I'm still I'm still like telling my trainer that I'm ready to fight again, get me another competition, and I'm still not sparring. So I don't think I really Why was that though? Because we didn't have a ring at <laughs> the kickboxing club. We didn't have a ring. So we, we couldn't learn any ring craft. Um, so you, your sparring is like you have to put yourself in there and you have to learn how to move around a ring. And There's nothing worse than sparring. I hate it. Oh, I love it. See, that's why I'm not a fighter. Oh, I love it. 
Like when I lived, I lived in Southampton for three years and trained at the Golden Ring. This is what you, sorry, I've got water and ice. This is what you have to learn how to do is you learn, you have to learn how to get into a ring with one of your best mates, beat the fuck out of each other and then just come out afterwards and go, do you want to go for some food after? And that's, that's what you learn from like. Yeah, that's like old Spartan camaraderie. Yeah. Like they train together, die together. Oh, we type used to. Mentality. I mean, I've had worse beatings off of my friends than I've ever had off of any opponent. And this is why the fighting used to be so easy. Because we would, I mean, my friend Nigel, a good friend of mine, Nigel, that I used to go and meet on a Monday morning. And Nigel used to wear the ties my tie boxing gloves, which you know you can feel your knuckles through them. And we, our Monday morning session was, we would go, we would warm up, and then we'd get in the ring and we'd, we would knock seven bells of shit out of each other for like 12 rounds in these fucking eight ounce gloves. So then when you get in the ring in a competition and you're sparring another geezer, and, and we had a hard gym as well. Like we had a right rep- reputation on, on the actual um, competition circuit. It, it got to the point where people didn't want to fight us. There was two gyms in, in London that people just didn't want to fight. One was the Bulldog Gym in East London and the other one was our gym, Bushido Gym in Croydon. So it'd be, it would get, it got to a point where you'd be matched to fight someone and they'd pull out as soon as they found out that you were from Bushido Jimmy Croydon. Was that above inch-ups? It was, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but it's going to quickly, just a quick, Bushido used to be where FX was. So when, oh, yeah. so they refurbed upstairs in the inch-ups and um, turned it into this um, multi-roomed martial arts centre and then moved out of the FX gym where, where FX was, and then Martin came and took it over with Russian Alex. Yeah, that's it. Turned it into a bodybuilding gym, and I was their first member to ever sign up because I've obviously gone nosing around, wanted to find out what's going on. Met Martin, and uh, signed up to FX Gym as the first member. So, that, for, tell tell everyone about FX and what like this fill people in. So, in shops was like a bunch of shops, like an indoor market. Almost, so it's almost like an indoor market. And instead of market stalls, you had little units little, yeah. that were all, already set there. So FX Gym, I'll tell you, this is how you can sum up FX Gym. And this is no word of a lie. FX Gym was m- mentioned when they recruited new police into Croydon. So you know when you 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 know when you start as a new police officer and you get your briefing, this is the area that you live li- working in now. This is what you can expect. FX Gym was on their briefing. This is what I got told. It was a hub, things. though. It was a hub of like villains and. Like, the, the, do you remember the time when there was like the, the local junkies would come come down there and you could literally order anything and they'd go out and rob it, bring it back, yeah. sell it to you for 20 quid? The shoplifters would come in there, they'd have bagfuls of steak. You could say, you could order stuff, get me this, get me that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, like literally, you could have anything you want delivered to that gym. And I think the, re- the when it when that gym got so lively was there was two gyms, two bodybuilding gyms in Croydon. So you had FX gym in the in shops at the back of the in shops, and you had the gym in Hancroft Road. Yeah. And there was a shooting at um, the gym, so yeah. they had a bodybuilding um, what do you call it a seminar. So they had a professional bodybuilder turn up to um, greet the people that train at the gym, and there was a dispute between two rival bodybuilders and one guy shot the other guy twice which is what closed the gym down and then obviously then everyone came to fx so if you were a a villain in croydon and you were trying to avoid people that you'd upset before you had two gyms you could choose from but now you only had one so like everyone who like had upset people and would come into fx and because i was a manager there I'd always have to settle disputes. I never, I never forget once having to move two groups of guys out of the gym, and they're they're having a knife fight outside the gym, literally. And it, it, the, the ones pulled a knife out, and I'm like, "What the fuck are you doing? Like, move the fuck away from here. Go somewhere else and do it." You know, I, I've got a funny story about the gym once. I was closing up. Oh, you worked there, did yeah, you? I forgot. Man. Yeah, we've all we've all we've all done our shifts at uh, FX. Yes, um, I was working there once, and it was right in my heyday when I was really into training and stuff. And uh, a kid comes running in. Must have been seventeen, eighteen. Come running in, straight into the toilet. And I'm like, what is going on here? Anyway, another load of them come running in, 
and they're trying to kick the door in. That one's come running back, picked up a dumbbell, gone running down there. So I've gone, like, I've jumped up. What's going on? You, you, out. Anyway, they've gone out. I don't know how. Anyway, they've gone out, and all of a sudden, three or four cars pull up, and uh, they all get, they all get out. And I was like, lads, yeah. this can't happen at this gym. No. Like I, I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying this is a gym that's got serious people attached to it. You can't be doing this here. It's off limits. And he's like, what are you going to do? And I was like, listen, you're going to have to do this another day. And I just fronted it out. And I'm standing in between the door. There's about 10 geezers, three cars, kids in the in the toilet. And I talked them down and I managed yeah. to get rid of them. But mate, that was, uh, there's been a few incidents like that in, in effects. It wasn't unheard of. Well, I, I was attacked in FX. Had my Let's get back to that though. Because I'm interested in telling your story. We've covered effects. What's next for you? You're so you, you're fighting. Um, my I my fighting lasted for as long as it. it I literally kickboxing only lasted for about five years for me because I got into a street fight in um, a club in Croydon and damaged my knee so badly that I couldn't teach kickboxing anymore or compete in it. So that kind of ended that for me. But then um, I got into the unlicensed boxing. So when I was doing my thing in Coyd and my door work and obviously working at FX and now I had a guy approach me and he was like, um, would you be interested in doing the unlicensed boxing? And he said like the guys that used to promote all the old fights such like Joey Powell Sr., he used to promote the fights between Roy Shaw and Lenny McLean. Yeah. And they're like, we're bringing it to South London and they're just putting putting the word out there who wants to have a go. And I was like, I'll fucking do it. Was, as far as I was concerned, at the time, it was just like, that's just another string to my bow. It's going to add to my reputation. It's going to elevate me higher up this ladder of craziness that I was already going up. That was at Caesars in Stratton, wasn't it? Yeah, Caesar's nightclub in Stratton. So they filmed Snatch there. So Snatch, Snatch is based loosely around the unlicensed boxing world. And the first fight on that film where Brad Pitt has a boxing match and is told to take a dive and doesn't, knocks the geezer out. That's filmed in Caesar's. Wasn't that that character based on a, um, a traveller from Croydon? I from Adam? I don't, maybe. Yeah. That, that, that Brad Pitt character was based on a traveller from Adam. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably thinking, I'm, I'm probably, I'm thinking who you're talking about. I'm not yeah. going to say his name. But no. Yeah, 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 yeah. But, that aside, now, getting to unlicensed boxing, we've all seen the videos, it's, it's unlicensed for a reason. It's quiet. It's fucking mental. <laughs> it's it's fucking go. mental. So my family stopped, my, my second to well, I think my second to last fight, my family, my mum and dad said we're not coming anymore because someone got thrown off the top balcony. So my, I've got a VIP table for my family next to the ring, and then you got the balconies <laughs> with like twenty or thirty quid to get up. Someone's thrown someone off the balcony, and they've landed on the table, like two tables away from my mum and dad. And my mum and dad are like, "Listen, we, we we don't mind supporting you, but we're not coming to that anymore." Like those those. Those events were fucking lively. Mental. Like, you arrive there, and you just just to look at the security, you look at the security walking in, and you're like, these boys are expecting fucking trouble. Like, they were monsters, and they were like, there's metal detectors, there's fucking the, the metal thingies, that, the metal detector that you put over the body. You've got to walk for a metal detector. The bouncers look, I used to be a bouncer, but these bouncers look like they can fucking kill you, because they're working for some of the biggest crime families at the time in London. And anyone who was, I remember, I'll never forget my first unlicensed fight. Anyone who was anyone in London was there because yeah. it was Joey Pyle's first um, showing at Caesars in South London. So, like, I'm talking about fucking everyone came to that. So, there was some naughty, naughty people there. But it, it would just go off randomly in, in, in oh, the like, fights in the crowd. The, the fights in the crowd are ridiculous. I never forget, right? It kicked off. I was sitting on the stage. Um, after, after my fight, so I won my fight. Then I'm sitting up on the top table at the top stage. And it kicked off behind me, and it went on and on and on, like a massive big fight. And and something happened, like the girl I was seeing at the time got a drink spilled on her. So all I've done is push a geezer and say to him, "Move the fuck away." 
And within three weeks, by the time the story had gone around Croydon, I'd started it. So like, I'm now looking at, like, there's a family from Mitchell that want to kill you or or so-and-so is going to come and shoot you because of this, because of that. And I'm, because I've, I'm standing on this stage of a tattooed head and I'm in the middle of it all, like, people just started talking shit and then they were like, tattooed on side. <laughs> <laughs> so how far did you go with that? With the unlicensed yeah. boxing? I... I did two years in that war. I won every fight. I won two belts. And then when I stopped fighting for them, they employed me to bodyguard their ring girls. So I used to... <laughs> I know, it's a shit life, isn't it? <laughs> so, yeah, I I went from I went from literally being their headline act. So I used to, like, be main event. And we used to pack the place out. And then they... When I said I don't want to fight anymore, they were like, you do security for the ring girls. So... If, if I must <laughs> if I must <laughs> so they're all there and there's like five girls in a room and they're all getting their outfits on and no one else allowed in except for me so I'm like alright then <laughs> I don't mind doing that so I did the bodyguarding for um, the ring girls because obviously the girls walking around in these types of events if you if they got someone there with them they're getting grabbed they're getting like propositioned or people stand in front of them and don't let them get past and but yeah, I did a, I did the security, the bodyguarding for their ring girls for a few shows after that. And fuck me, even one of them shows, like some naughty people turned up and started arguing outside. And when I say naughty people, I'm talking about murderers. Like people that I knew were, were killing people at the time. And it's all going off outside. And I'm like, well, as long as the girls are safe, like, I'm, I'm all right. I'll just hide in the corner. Yeah. Take them all in the corner and put my arms around you. Like, don't, don't look up. So I say, you. I'll take the bottles on the back of the head. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you're a champion, you're a champion, unlicensed boxer. I was. I did win two title belts at the unlicensed game. And how many fights did you have? Only four. Yeah. So you went up the ranks pretty quick. Well, the first fight I ever had at their show, I wasn't supposed to win because it was one of their best lads. So the, the guy that got me into it was called Teddy Barnett. So Teddy Barnett himself, he, he was a villain. I don't know if you, know, I don't know if you yeah. remember his name. So he was very, very well known. And it was him, it was Teddy Barnett that approached me. And obviously me at the time, I just wanted people to know who I was. So I was like, I'll fucking do it. And it was like, it was so basically the first guy that they put me in with, this is, this is the funny thing because the fights got easier as they went along. So obviously the first two guys that I fought were these ex-Russian Lithuanian pro boxers that they brought over. Um, and I wasn't supposed to win the first fight. I was like, you, you ain't going to beat him. So I beat this guy, and then they were like, okay, fair enough. And then I beat this second guy, who was also very, very good, and that was when they started thinking, hang on a minute, he's selling a lot of tickets, and he's bringing a lot of people to these events, like, let's make his fights a bit easier. So once you've finished that, let's go back in time. Now, I know you've got an interesting story about DJ and Ibiza and then having to go to Israel. Oh, tell, yeah. Let's tell that story. So, when I was 20, so I've been DJing in Ibiza 95, 96. I took 97 off so I could um, focus more on my fighting. So, I was training like six days a week, two hours a day. Really, really, really put the work in. And I got asked if I, if I was interested in turning pro as a boxer. And I, I I didn't want to. So all I, all I wanted to do was go back to Ibiza the following year. And um, what happened was I went back to Ibiza in 1998 and I was told from people that I know, there's this guy who's like running it out here. And um, don't look at him. Don't fuck with him. Don't mess with him. So I'm like, well, I, I'm not a gangster. I'm, I'm just a geezer that's out here doing a bit of DJing. So I thought nothing about it. And then I've accidentally gone and tried to chat his missus up in a nightclub. <laughs> Pissed out of my head. So that led to me and him having a street fight, which I won. And I was rushed off the island the same, literally the same night. So by the time I sobered up, I'm standing in Gatwick. My brother's picking me up and I'm getting phone calls from my beef. And people are telling me, you need to disappear. Like, these people are going to come looking for you. So what happens? I had to, I had to, it's it, it funny because it's Martin, the manager of FX that said to me, go to Israel. <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? He's like, go to Israel. I was like, 
all right then, I've got I've got like five hundred quid left. So I went uh, to the Australian Embassy in London, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, what you got for me? And they were like, we're going to put you on a kibbutz in between the borders of Lebanon and Syria. And it all happened within the space of about two weeks. So I'm DJ. I went from DJing in Ibiza <laughs> to working in the kitchen of a kibbutz in a fortnight. And my first job in this kitchen, in this kibbutz in Israel, was cutting the tops and bottoms off a brand of beans. And they brought out this fucking sack like that. And it took me six hours. And I'm actually, I'm, I'm laughing. So I'm doing it. And I'm laughing my fucking head off because I'm like, look at you, you cunt. Look at what you've look at what you fucked up. Like, how can you go from a nice cushy life in Ibiza, two bedroom apartment, a, a decent job, and now you're cutting up run of beans just because you had a fucking tear up with someone? It could have it could have only happened to me. Like it, these extreme things you you hear about, and it's like it's almost like the universe says, "Let's see what let's see what he's." Well, what was that like? So you rush off the island. You. You come come around sober, you're in Gatwick, and you're kicking about. And you're like, "What's happened?" Terrified. When, you I, when I found when I found out who they were and what what links they had in England and and how high up their links went, I was 22 years old. I was absolutely fucking terrified. Like I, I, I went and stayed in my sister's house for two weeks, and then like I was like, I'm, like people were contacting me, people that I'd known for years in my beef were contacting me and saying you need to disappear. Like, you need to get the fuck out of England. Like, cause... What was your first plan? <laughs> <laughs> Try not to die. <laughs> my first plan, I didn't have a first, my first plan was stay in a fucking IB for until October. Yeah, like, but now you're back. Like, now you're hiding out of your sisters. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but, like, what, where did you go from there? Like, all all I, get... I was a child. I was 22 years old. I could have, I could have a tear up. So I was just like, I'm 22 years old and I'm being told by people that I know and trust that there's a good possibility someone's going to try and kill you and they've killed people before. So you need to fucking disappear. You need to make yourself scarce. And I'm not a very inconspicuous guy. No. Like, <laughs> I'm quite easily recognisable because I had I had the tattoos on the head at the time as well. So I was like, I need to get the fuck out of here. So it was mine who said to me, <laughs> go Israel. I mean, imagine that. Go Israel. Of all the places. Yeah, go to Israel. Well, right, though. Because no one's following into Israel. No, no one's lucky. And if no they one. are, they yeah. ain't finding no. I was in between the Golan Heights in northern Israel. <laughs> the king between the borders of Lebanon and Syria. I'm laughing because it's so random. Yeah. And I'm like, and and I'm, but I'm still on edge because I'm like, are they going to go looking for me? Like, are they, are they, are they, are they, are they going to let it go? Like, are they going to... So how long was you in Israel for? <laughs> Six months. <laughs> <laughs> and what was it like? So you're cutting up runner beans, which I've renamed. I hate one. I hate the name runner beans. It doesn't make any sense. I call them long peas. Long peas, yeah. yeah. That, that's a good idea. <laughs> long peas. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah why this is called runner beans? I don't know. They're long peas. Because you, you open them up, peas come out, don't they? Yeah. So they're long peas. Yeah. <laughs> makes more sense. Yeah. So I was in between the borders of Lebanon and Syria, and <laughs> it was going off. So I'd say four nights out of four nights a week, I would go to sleep to the sound of gunfire <laughs> and missile, <laughs> missile attacks. Well, wait, what is a kibbutz, first of all? A kibbutz is a self-contained community that was set up after World War II when they decided to seize, as far as I know, they, they created Israel as a sovereign state. Yeah, it was created after. It was World created War II, after yeah. World War Two, and all the displaced Jews from around the world were told, "If you go to Israel, you've got somewhere to live and somewhere to settle." So these kibbutz, a kibbutz is a settlement, a self-contained settlement of human beings. Sometimes only like five or six hundred people, and you go there. So you imagine I've gone from Ibiza, <laughs> I've gone from DJ in Ibiza to this little fucking settlement in in the arse end of nowhere. And I'm helping them out. You're a volunteer, so you're getting you're unpaid. <laughs> you get a bed, you get food, and you work for eight hours a day, six days a week for nothing. What is it like out there, though? Mental. Fucking mental. Especially when Saddam Hussein started saying he was going to fire, like, gas missiles over the border. And my mum's saying to me, come back, come back. And I'm like, it's just getting good. <laughs> it's literally just starting to get good. Describe a day out there. A day? Um, well... 
the, I was out there in the hottest summer in 30 years. 1998 was the hottest summer in Israel for 30 years. And I was living in a, a room that was like a single story and it had a tarmac roof and no air con. So it was like an, it was like an oven. It was like a little, little hot box. And then I used to open, leave the door open. And I was told, you're not supposed to leave your door open. You're not supposed to lock it. And I was like, why is that? And they were like, well, 10 years, it hasn't happened for a while, but 10 years ago, the Hezbollah came down from the mountains and got onto a local kibbutz. And before they were stopped, they like beheaded a load of families. So I'm like, okay, I still left my door open. Yeah. So basically, yeah, it was, you were, you were in the middle of a war zone. So you get up at 7am, I'd get up. And I, so, so after working in the dining hall, of the kibbutz, I was moved, because I was a hard worker, and because I was punctual, I was moved over to the um, the hotel kitchen, so basically, it was better food, and better hours, so I had to do a morning shift, I think I did 7am to 11, and then I did, um, I went back for the dinner time, which I think was 6 to 8, so it was quite good, because I, I, I finished at midday, and then I'm off down the swimming pool, for like five or six hours, and then I'm and then I go back to the hotel in the evening. Sounds like a sounds like a lunatic story. It was it was mad. It was mad, especially because just all the every when you're in Israel, there's guns everywhere and yeah. there's soldiers everywhere. Every single male was going to the army for I think three or three and a half years. And, yeah, national service. Yeah. and every single female is going to the army for one and a half years. So. Where I had the background in training and the gym, I actually linked up with an Israeli lad who had a bomb shower that he turned into a gym. And he was like getting ready to do his national service. So I was like, if you let me use the gym with you, I'll personal train you. So I had access to this little gym in a bomb shower and was training him at the same time to start to lose some weight so he could start his national service. Sounds amazing. Was it life changing going out there? Was it life changing? Do you know what? I'll, I'll tell you the truth. My experience in Israel in 1998 helped me cope with the lockdown of 2020. So when wow. yeah, so I I had a couple of days. So I'll just let, let you know quickly. So the beginning of 2020, my my dad died, and we buried we, we cremated him in February. Three weeks after his funeral, we were put on lockdown because of COVID. So. I've had to isolate in a house. I'm away from my family. And like it, after about two or three days, my head started to go a little bit funny. But then I pulled myself together and I was like, you've been here. Like, you've been here. You you went to Israel. You had a threat hanging over you that you could have been killed. You went into the northern part of Israel, which is almost a war zone. And you stayed there for six months until things settled down. If you can do that at 22... You can do this at forty five. Yeah, I, I know exactly what you mean because I was so pleased when the lockdown was because I was working, I was working a lot, and I was so pleased. I was like, "Lovely, the government are going to give us some dough. I'm not going to have to work." And for the first couple of weeks, it was lovely. It was a paid holiday. Yeah. It was lovely, and then I started getting very self destructive, and I started rehashing old ways yeah um and it was and it didn't end well for me the lockdown um and i've had to work really hard to keep myself straight after what well, on the um the following lockdowns it's been rough well, half of the uk turned into alcoholics well yeah it was like let's just get on it so everyone was on the piss well this is this is what this is what happened with me i was like because you wasn't doing anything all day like it was even questionable whether you went out for a walk or anything now, I was shielded anyway, so I was a bit like, geez, what do I do? There was so much uncertainty, and then you know, you get up in the morning, not get changed or anything like that, and, and have like a little tipple before you go to bed, it's just to sort of mm. get, mate, before I knew it, I was doing a bottle of night. Yeah, it's easy. And then it's just like a downward hill from there, isn't it? Yeah, no, it's, it's easy to get into that, um, that rut, and I think a lot of people did. Yeah, I do, I do. So, we're back from Israel. How did you find out if you so were back to go? So basically, while I was in Israel, I decided to grow my hair <laughs> and change my appearance, 
which actually worked because when I come back to England, I was sitting in a pub and next to this geezer and the guy started talking about me and I was sat next to him, but he didn't know it was me. It was like, oh, he was telling me, oh, I used to go kickboxing with this bloke called John and he used to teach me. And I'm about to look at him, it is me. Like, I've just got hair. So, <laughs> so I was like, fucking brilliant. Like, if, if like, if he ain't recognising me, a hitman ain't recognising me. So yeah, just it just sort of the anxiety and the fear kind of eased, and you got to understand like. But how did you find out? Because they call that greenlit, didn't they? So you've been greenlit to be assassinated, if you like. That sounds dramatic. But how did you find out that it was all okay? I didn't. <laughs> I just I just thought well, I think I come back to England and I kind of like cracked on, and then I just you, you just kind of think to yourself you. Don't forget, when you're young, you've got a very childlike way of thinking. So like now, with the experience that I've got now, I know that nine out of ten threats are never seen through. So, I mean, you think when I used to sit in FX and when I used to get up to the things I used to get up to, everyone knew where I was sitting. And I got so many death threats and so many people that were saying, we're going to come down the gym and kill you. And so it got to the point where it's like, <laughs> I'm sitting in there and I'm thinking, right, I've been here five years and I ain't dead yet. Mate, I'll be honest with you. I was quite gobby. Yeah. Like, I was just, not in a horrible way, I just talked too much. Yeah, yeah. And I would I say, I'd say things and people would get offended and I wouldn't even know they was offended. It's like I was almost autistic with other yeah. people's feelings. And, uh, yeah, I, I, I had, I had uh, a mutual friend of ours phone us, phone me and say, uh, yeah, I've just had to smooth something out for you. They was going to come down and stab you today. Yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, what, have I sent them down? He's like, no, 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 yeah. relax. You've got, like, you're going to have to make good. They're coming down in about an hour. Um, just make good. That gym was mental. Like, there was so many, so many situations in that place. So where you could just get and yourself into trouble. There's been so many well-known people go through that gym as well. Yeah. So what's, what else have you done? So actually, this is quite, this is this is your next journey. You worked in the gym for a while, then you started up your own gym, which is another whole set of craziness. Steel gym in New Addington. Yes, which yeah. I went to as well. Oh yeah, yeah. Me and my brother. So um, that was another thing I was told, you ain't gonna do that. This is what I wanted to get onto, is you was, because I remember one time, you got married um, to, <laughs> Mine's cousin. Yeah. <laughs> After nine weeks. <laughs> After nine weeks. And everyone was like, oh, you're dumb. Why are you doing that? Well, it turns out that was right. But, I, <laughs> but you said to me, I was like, well, just do it. What's the worst that can happen? Fuck we it. just get divorced. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's a big deal? It was, I, I'm glad I did it. It was, it was a buzz. Hide out of Carson and Essex. <laughs> we never lived together. So, yeah. It, it, and this is a story of your life. Like, you just do things. And yeah, very, very, no, um, it's, it's more to do with the fact that I do the shit that people are too scared to do. So I, every single thing I've ever done, I've been terrified of doing it and I've got, I've done it anyway. Let's see what happens. Like, yeah, because you had the gym, well, you was managing the gym down in Croydon, um, for mine, a mutual friend of ours, um, and you two had a falling out, it's well known, you're friends now. Anyway, you had a falling out. And you went your separate way and created steel gym. gym. Yeah. Which was something I was told I was never gonna do. No. And not only and then when I opened Steel Gym, I had Ronnie Coleman visit six months later. Yeah, I remember. And I and I when I said that Ronnie Coleman was like people were like, John's smoking crack. Like yeah, I remember. <laughs> you're not getting Ronnie Coleman to come to New Addington. Like New Addington is a council estate in South London. Ronnie Coleman is the most highly decorated bodybuilder in the world. People like, and even even I didn't believe it up until the point where I see him get out of the car because you got that you got that feeling of like, it's if like I I I believe fake it till you make it. Like say you're gonna do something, speak it out into the universe and make it happen. Like I've done with everything, but even on the day I've got two hundred people waiting in my gym, and I'm like I know Ronnie Coleman's coming because I've arranged it, <laughs> but what if he doesn't come? Yeah, like yeah, yeah. I'm gonna look like a right cunt. So there was like, I put it all out on Facebook. I've made posters, like these online posters. Ronnie Coleman, eight times Mr. Olympia, is coming to Steel Gym. You have no idea the amount of people that would have been there that day if they thought it was going to happen. Because they were like, that's, that's, John's talking shit. There's no way he's getting Ronnie Coleman to visit New Addington. 
And what happens? Car pulls up, door opens, out gets Ronnie Coleman. And I'm like, thank fuck for that. <laughs> so I've got, Ronnie, I've got Ronnie Coleman sitting in the office eating chicken and rice, sitting next to Leah Francis, who was like the, the number one nuts and zoo model at the time. Like when I used to have her come and visit the gym, the gym would be packed and it would lit, she'd be in the office and it'd be just geezers training for every every two minutes looking over. Well, yeah. Trying to get a glimpse of her. Yeah, well, like, honestly, um, it was a small gym in a little unit, wasn't yeah. it, really? It's an industrial unit. It was a decent little gym, though. Um, but yeah, it was quite rare to have a knockout woman training in that gym. Yeah. So if she was in there, it was just a byproduct. Well, she was like staring. the number one glamour model in the UK at the time. She was on everything. She was on the front cover of all the lads' How mags. I was a DJ in a strip club in Southampton, <laughs> and I met her when she was 18 years old, and we became Hold friends. On. Let's rewind to that. That is a whole story we missed out on it. You was a DJ in Southampton. Yeah. Let's tell the story why you ended up in Southampton. Because some people tried to kill me in FX. <laughs> <laughs> so I had, the, I had the stuff go on in FX, where I, I literally had to have my left arm rebuilt with titanium. I'd been hit over the head, back, legs with baseball bats. I'm in hospital. Then I've got some other geezer t- turning up to the club. Let's talk for me. about that though. Why did that happen? Because I headbutted someone for not paying their gym membership. <laughs> over about 15 quid. No, it was 50 quid. But I think it was more to do with the, more to do with the way that the guy spoke to me. Gotcha. You, you, so yeah, yeah I wasn't being I wasn't being confrontational and I wasn't being aggressive at all towards him on the day that I spoke to him and there was four of them and one of me and I know the minute I did it I regretted it like so so he said something to me he said to me who, who the fuck are you talking to and I thought am I intimidating him so I thought make yourself as as least intimidating as possible so I sat down on the bench and I didn't make eye contact and I and I said to him that you've got to pay this money and he said it again he said who the fuck are you talking to so I stood up and headbutted him and the minute I did it, I was like, why did you probably do Probably a few other ways you could have resolved that situation. <laughs> yeah, it's probably probably not the sort of thing that somewhere like Easy Gym would want you to deal with no, that membership no. problems. Yeah. Probably lost your job for that. Yeah. So but instead, he ended up, uh, well, tell the story. So this guy that I headbutted then decided to come back two weeks later with some of his, his family members were very, very well known in South London at the time. Um, they came back I had a baseball bat put across my head my, my left arm got shattered that was rebuilt with titanium I think I took a few hits over the back I took a few hits over the legs before I got out of there so I did manage to get out which I was very very lucky to do so and, do you think um, they were going to kill you? do I think they were going to kill me? I'm not sure I don't think they wanted to kill me but when you when you hit someone over the head with a baseball you're bat the <laughs> you're going you're going to you probably like any like there's any outcome from that really. So the doctors at the hospital said you're very very lucky to survive. They said it was your training like because obviously I've been doing a lot of bodyboarding and a lot of boxing. And they said if it wasn't for your training, you'd probably be in a lot. Sorry, my neck's a bit sore. If it wasn't for your training, you'd be in a much much worse state than you are today. You're very very lucky just to have a shattered left arm because like I had a big bat mark across my face and it was like um, blood coming out the side of my eye so I had needed my left arm needed to be completely rebuilt but this was this was energy that I've been putting out into the universe for a long time yeah I wanted to get to that because you was you you was never ho- horrible you no, just I, I wasn't horrible but I was just you was ready all the time it didn't I take a lot no, and I was fighting the wrong kind of people as well. So I'd, I'd get my, I'd, I wouldn't go out and pick fights with people that were just having a night out or doing nothing. I would go out and I'd pick fights with people that were known and had and had a lot of, um, a lot of clout. If, if apart from the time you slapped the geezer silly in the kebab shop, no, I don't even know what that is. That could have happened. Like, what kebab shop? One in Croydon, he just kept slapping him. With the open hand, you go, it's all right, I can't be done for GBH because I'm slapping him with an open hand. I see, this is what I mean. There's so many stories, I don't remember half of it. But I'd, I'd got to the position in my life where I had created so much negative energy 
that I had accepted that I would not sit, live to see 30. So I'd kind of accepted that I'm definitely, definitely getting killed by the time I'm 30. And it's like, I'm sitting, I'm standing, I'm either standing in a nightclub or I'm sitting in a gym and everyone knows who I am and everyone knows where I am. And I'm like, you're going to get killed. So it was like, when I got attacked and I survived it, I, t- I re- took a restock of my life and I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Like, what are you actually doing? Mm. Like, there's, a- there's no reason for you to be running around doing this sort of stuff. You've There's other things you can be doing. You know, I mean, I'm not a stupid person. I've got, I've got um, other ways I can apply myself. But it's just, it was just the way I was living my life at the time. So you went to Southampton after that? After I got attacked in FX, I come out of the hospital, I went back to FX, straight from the hospital, because I wanted to, I wanted to make a statement that, okay, look, you beat me, but I didn't want to, I didn't want to be a coward. And I also didn't want to retaliate. So I had a lot of people saying, oh, what, what are we going to do about it? We're going to do, and I'm going to listen. I, I, want, I don't want any more trouble for my parents, because I remember, I remember seeing my mum and dad's face, face at the hospital and looking at them thinking, you deserve better than this, like, and I'm not doing this anymore. So I decided to not retaliate and I spent another five months in Croydon and I was just like, you know what, I need to get away, I need a break. So at the time I was a bouncer in a walkabout in Croydon and the DJ, who was also a very good friend of mine, owned a DJ company called Event London and he was um, working for a, a DJ company called LMM, Live Music Management, and he said to me, John, look, you've DJed before, get your music up to date, I will give you some gigs down on the South Coast. So I started off doing one gig a week in Portsmouth and one gig a week in Southampton and then driving back to Croydon. And then I was like, why don't I just fucking move down there? So I literally went to Southampton and got a one bedroom flat and moved down there. And I didn't, I didn't know a single person, but it was so nice to walk around a shopping centre and not have to think, am I going to get killed? So... <laughs> It was like nice to sit and have a coffee and think, yeah. I've got my back to the public, but no one's going to come and stick something in the back of my head. So yeah, it was it was it was different. It was so different coming away from Croydon and going to Southampton. Then I ended up landing a few more DJ gigs down there. So I was I was doing four nights a week in Southampton and living down there. And you, as you know, you came down with, yeah. all, with all the FX lads. They so all came down and coach and visited me at the walkabout. It was brilliant. That was a brilliant night. night. Yeah. Um, anyway, I can't say that to camera. Anyway, <laughs> yeah. it was a, it was a good night. So after this, I know you like. So after Steel Gym, so we're bouncing about on the timeline a bit here. But after Steel Gym, it wasn't too long after that that you decided to be a tattoo artist. I decided to be a tattoo artist while I was while I still had Steel Gym. So I had a few health issues. I had a tumor taken out of my neck. I got a serious infection, ended up back in a high dependency unit for three days, and I was couldn't take any time off of work to um, recover. So I was like, literally, I went in the hospital for two days, had this tumour taken out of my neck. Um, I came out of the hospital, I went back to work, and then all my neck and my head and my jaw started going red and hot and inflamed, and then I was told, go back to the hospital. I went back and they were like, we're really, really sorry, but we've got to take you straight back in. They took me back into a high dependency unit. Um, I spent three days in there while they got rid of this infection. I came came out of there and went back to work, back to the gym seven days a week. And so I'm sitting in the gym, and this is four years in now, and I'm thinking I don't want to fucking do this anymore. I remember, I remember it clearly. You was like, um, you was just like, I'm so done with this. I was done. Like, yeah, I was suffering from depression and didn't even know I had depression. Yeah. So people were saying you're displaying signs of depression and, I, and I'm like, I don't get depressed. Like, I'm not that person. But it just crept up on me. It took about a year to crept up on me. And then what I eventually did, I was doing the security for the Croydon Tattoo Convention. And so I'd met a lot of tattoo artists and some of the tattoo artists were training in my gym. So I sat down one day and I thought to myself, right, I want to get out of this. But I need to find, what I thought, what do poor people always <laughs> spend their money on? Because it certainly ain't fucking training. So I thought, right, what's the things that poor people spend their money on? Scratch cards, alcohol, drugs, um, and tattoos. I thought, right, I don't want to be a drug dealer. 
I don't want to own an off license. I don't want to sell scratch cards. I'm like, right, I'm going to learn to tattoo. So I said to my mate Jay, will you help me? And he's, he's literally, the next day he's turned up to the to the gym with all his equipment and starts setting up in the office and starts teaching me how to tattoo. And basically what happened was I gave my, so I owned 50% of Steel Gym. It got to a point where it was causing me so much mental problems and um, so much stress owning it that I just gave it to my mate. I was like, I don't want it anymore. And that's when I set about learning to be a tattoo artist. So would you say, because one of the things I'm really interested in in, in in life is finding your passion. Oh yeah, that's um, what I've found now. And you think that's your passion now? If I won the lottery tomorrow, I'd carry on tattooing. See, that says it all. Yeah. For me, um, I've had a few jobs in my lifetime. First I've done sales, quality in the gym for a bit. Um, I've even been a pizza delivery boy. Um, and you, you ate all the pizzas before you fucking delivered them. <laughs> well, listen, I was at my heaviest when I worked at Pizza Hut. <laughs> yeah. um, People turn up, there's a slice missing out of this fucking box. <laughs> but listen, then, um, sometimes I didn't even deliver a pizza, I would just eat it and go back and get another one. <laughs> but um, so, and then, I got, then I found um, being an electrician. And I really enjoyed it because it was a new challenge. It's hard but, to learn the minute being an electrician. <sighs> It's a whole different subject, man. I've got my opinions on it. Um, it's I enjoyed it. It was a challenge. Um, but I'm over it now. And I'm trying to find a passion for yeah. myself. Now, I think talking is my passion. Because yeah. I do it a lot. Um, and that's why I've come with these podcasts and stuff. But I know you found tattooing. For me, tattooing is like meditating. So you've obviously seen my designs. Of course. And you've seen how intricate and how how um, detailed they are. You have a specific style. Yeah, a very, I've developed a very, very specific style. And the reason I've managed to get to that point where I have that style is by turning turning down things I don't want to do. And that's another hard thing to do when you're learning to tattoo because money's money. And people look at things and are like, well, that's, that's 200 quid. And I'm, I say no to things I don't want to do. If I don't think I'm going to make it give it my own unique style, I won't be able to do it perfectly, I won't do it. For instance? <laughs> well, I don't do realism. So okay. I'm not going to fucking say to you, yeah, I'll do a portrait of your kid, <laughs> and then you end up with a fucking picture on your own, one eye going that way, one eye going that way. So yeah, I won't, I won't attack, I, this is what I mean, so I've, from working in the tattoo industry, I've seen a lot of people that will say, I'll do it, and they can't fucking do it. And so someone ends up with a piece of shit on their arm. Because someone wanted the money, not because they were passionate about giving that person the best tattoo they can ever do. So, how do you, how do you think tattooing has changed your life? Because once you find your passion, um, it's no longer work. It, how's it changed? Yeah, I don't go to work, and some sometimes I don't know what day it is. So I don't I don't have a Monday. I don't have a Friday. So I'm not I don't wake up on Friday and think thank fuck it's Friday, and I don't wake up on a Monday morning and think oh my god it's Monday. So I, I do what I I do what I want to do when I want to do it, and can still make a decent living. Yeah, and I can still look after myself, pay my bills, feed myself, and, and I've still got a car, and I've got freedom. They, they, there was a famous philosopher said, if you don't have two thirds of your day to yourself, you're a slave. So if you're getting up at six in the morning, so let's just say, for instance, these people that say I can't wait for it to be Friday, why? What are you doing? What the fuck are you doing with your life? If you hate your, you five days of your week, you hate it so much that you're wishing your life away, that you can't wait for it to be Friday. You're doing something wrong. You should, you should have, like, this is what, that's what Dana White said. Dana White said he hates three day weekends. He hates bank holidays. He said he, he, he wants to be doing something. So he's got his passion. He's doing something that he loves doing. He sold the UFC, but he still fucking works for him. He's still got his job at the UFC as the president of the UFC, even though he doesn't need to be there. It's actually really interesting because if you look at what he'd done, they bought that they bought the UFC for a million pounds, and really all they bought was a ring yeah. and the name UFC. Yeah. They didn't own anything else, none of the library, none of the existing library. No, they didn't even own UFC.com. Yeah. They didn't own anything. They had no regulation, no nothing. And it was him who took UFC from a cage and a name. 
Yeah. And got it to a mainstream sport now. Everyone he got it. He it. got it into fifty million pounds of debt and nearly went under. Yeah. Before he actually made it. Yeah, that was um, that was Forrest Griffin and Stefan Bonner fight, the first one that changed everything for him. Um, but you can't achieve that without a passion. No. You can't. You cannot achieve something like that without believing, without being able to look forward into the future and visualizing what you think it can be, not what it is, but. Dana White visualized what the UFC is today, and the thing as well, he's now he's now saying we ain't even started yet. He's saying we're not in enough countries. You, he, so the, the level that he's at now, he is now saying we ain't even started yet. We're taking it worldwide. We're taking it into every home. I think yeah, I think UFC is going to overtake boxing. I think once upon a time it could have done. Um, I don't think it will now. I think there's too much corruption going on in boxing. That used to be a thing, but you look at Eddie Hearn and, uh, Eddie Hearn and stuff like that, he gets a lot of stick, but he is as passionate as Dana about boxing. Yeah, but boxing, people avoid people in boxing. Floyd Mayweather and Manny Pacquiao didn't fight until they're both at the end of their fucking careers. Oh, this is true. This yeah. is true. But I think with Eddie Hearn, he, he's bringing in a new era of like, let's get it done. Let's get it done. Like, I'm not going to tell AJ, for instance, to dodge Fury. This but, AJ, but AJ has been dodging Fury. I don't know that. For years. I don't know that. I can't wait for him to fight. I, I think it only goes one way. What do you think? What do you think's going to happen? I think Fury um, just pieces him up. Well, he will. He's going to pick him apart. I think AJ would lose against Fury, and I think AJ would lose against Deontay Wilder. Yeah. Because he gets hit too much. Yeah. And Deontay Wilder will put him out. Yeah, I just punch in boxing. And at the end of the day, he in the second fight against Ruiz, got, he he got he beat him up. He ran away from him for twelve. Yeah, rounds. and he got tagged. Yeah, he got tagged twice or three times. He ran away from him for twelve rounds. Just jabbed him on the outside, uh, and he got caught a few times. And if that was against a big hitter like uh, Wilder, pff, yeah, he'd be put away. John, I feel like we have come to the end of this session. Well, this therapy session. Nice being your first guest on your first live face to face podcast. Yes, it's, it's it's been interesting, mate. I've listen. We're going to have to do a part two because yeah. there's so much more to this story that we haven't unpacked. Let's hope it makes some sense to the people watching it because it's been kind of flitted backs and forwards. But my life, my life's got so many different chapters. Sometimes I, I sometimes I sit there and I look at things I've done and I'm like, fucking hell, like, how have you managed to fit all that in? And it is it, it is. There are a lot of layers to the story. It's, it's an amazing life, and you're a funny guy. And it's a miracle that I'm still alive. <laughs> Kicking about. <laughs> still walking around corner at 45 years old. Thinking he's up. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still a little bit on. Oh, Harder than me anyway. Yeah. All right, John. Thank All you right, very bro. much.